does Marcellus Wallace look like? What? Say what again podcast this is our very first podcast and because it's our first podcast we thought we'd uh, do quentin tarantino after the show's named after one of his famous lines of pulp fiction um our, my co-host for this um this podcast is josh and daniel hey <coughs> so um so in latest news uh quentin tarantino has come out and said he's, he's going to be writing an r-rated star trek what do you guys think about that that's interesting very interesting. Very interesting. But it's kind of like it's kind of like Star Trek and sort of like R rated. They don't really seem to go together. Like, uh, like what do you think of Star Wars? Like Star Wars, it's kind of like it's it's interesting, you know, because Star Trek it's kind of been this kind of like kid kind of thing, you know. It's it's happy. It's suitable for kids, families, stuff like that. And it being R rated, that's just going to be a bit strange. Yeah. What do you think, Don? Uh, I think it would uh, knock a lot of loyal, hardcore fans away. That's definitely for sure. Because you know, as you just as you just said, Star Trek is a real you know sort of you know family friendly sort of style. You know, yeah. There's the newer ones where they're not afraid to show a little bit more death and a bit more violent. But R-rated is a bit of a leap, if you ask me. But yeah, <laughs> it's quite funny actually because um, since. Uh, They've they've slowly been getting darker, like but they've they've always been sort of PG thirteen, or well the Americans call it PG thirteen, but they're like twelve A here, yeah, yeah. and they're like getting like then they've been like twelve A and stuff like that going. Well, on. there's Discovery, and that's a fifteen now actually. So maybe we're edging a bit closer to yeah, the like a, a Tarantino yeah. kind of Star Trek. I'm expecting like explosions of blood and stuff in it. Yeah, well, yeah, like those little funny plasma guns blowing huge holes into people. It's, yeah. a, it's a bit out of nowhere. And Tarantino doesn't really have a filming style for um, Star Trek. Star Trek's a bit, I don't know. No, because he's never yeah. really done a sci-fi, has he? No, he hasn't. He's always no. been like traditional kind no. of gangsterish. He likes his Westerns. gritty places, and Star Trek yeah. is this real clean, smooth sci-fi, isn't it? So, that'd be quite something, wouldn't it? Yeah. But as you said, like, Star Trek Discovery, it could be easing people into, like, slowly getting to an R-rated sort of thing, because mm. obviously, like, the fans are, like, from the original, when it started back in the 70s and 80s, like, or it might just be 80s, I'm not sure. Um, 60s, actually, yeah. 60s? Yeah, that's, that's how old it is. Early. Might have been even in the 50s, but I know it was in the 60s. It was really... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't start off on TV, and then it kind of went off to, like... Um, it then went on to, like, the movies and stuff. And then we had Star Trek Genesis, which I think is in the DVD part some, somewhere. Um, but it's kind of like... I don't know, it's a bit weird, that is. Or, um, so, on, so moving on from that obviously, is um, Tarantino's soundtrack. So what, what are your guys' favourite soundtracks from Tarantino movies? Ooh, that's a nice wide category we've got here. Right, I like it. So, you going to start? I'll probably, like, I can't really say soundtrack, but I can say specific songs, like, you know, Hanging Flowers on the Wall and Lonely Shepherd. The bit was playing in the end of Kill Bill Volume 2, or Volume 1, and the fight scene, I liked that, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to say the Kill Bill actually soundtrack. If anything, yeah. not many people say that, but I like that one. I think my favorite Tarantino soundtrack would have to be the Hateful Eight. Yeah. Like the score from that film was just awesome. Like it wasn't Tarantino's classic kind of '70s pop no. kind of songs. It was like orchestral. Like orchestrated, and it was just yeah. He, he was kind of trying to get that sort of spaghetti western film. I've forgotten the director for it, but you know he had that very strong orchestral style. Too, yeah, I think that's what he was trying to get. It yeah. was the soundtrack taken from 
the thing. It was the same composer. I think it was like oh, okay. Inicio Morcone or something like that. Mm. And uh, that soundtrack was just great. It's quite funny actually because um, basically, like, what he wants to do is because um, he sees sort of like similarities between his work and the thing. Because he basically what he pointed was like from especially in Hate Flake, he was like, there's four walls in the cinema, so it's like they bounce through all of them. Um, it can only go out towards the screen to yeah. build that tension, and the soundtrack also does that very well, I think. Um, but also, Django had a really good soundtrack, yeah, with Freedom and that lot, so that, that, that's one of my favourites. Like, obviously, Freedom, Django, and like, um, what, who did that to you? The two pack ones are really good as well, those. Uh, Unchained, I think it was called. Django yeah. Unchained. Yeah. Well, no, Unchained was the name of the song by two pack. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, which is, sorry, I always remember it's like just the sort of Django and Chain with two packets. Really yeah, it's, it's a mixed match of songs. Like, it has like two titles because it's like got two songs in it. It's got yeah. Payback and it's also got Two Pack. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's quite funny because he always uses quite 80s music, yeah. which is quite interesting because he always goes to sort of the 70s and 80s and a lot of his references come from those, that sort of era of movies, yeah. which is quite interesting. Um, but um, yeah, that's fair. Any others like from Reservoir Dogs? Because obviously Reservoir Dogs has really good sound. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, they made those songs even a little more extra popular. Yeah. <laughs> Stuck in the middle with you and all. So yeah. A little green bag as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. He, uh, the, the version, the green bag version in the beginning wasn't that its own version sung actually for the film too. No, I think. Was it? Yeah. There's been a few versions. It was the Dutch version before that one, I think. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Just makes you want to torture someone with that song. <laughs> Tom Graham probably, but that's a, just a guess. Um, so yeah, is that everything we got on soundtrack? Is there anything else? Like, yeah. you know, cool. Um, so yeah, that's basically soundtracks done. That's all the latest news on him. Just thinking. So let's have an ad break now uh, with Sweet Sue's canned chicken dog food. Um, it's a uh, UK launching, and it's. Um, actually pretty good. What do you guys think about it? it? It's a brilliant, brilliant product. Like, I can feed my dog just one can of this a day and he'll be stuffed. It's brilliant. What are you? Yep. Chicken. Dog loves chicken. Who doesn't love chicken? I mean, Tom Graham's going to have it, so it's got to go to someone. Um, That's for obsessing. I know, I'm, I'm Tom. I just feel like bullying him today. Yeah. Um, and um, we also like to start um, thank our Kickstarters as well. Do you guys want to? Yeah. Thanks to Alex Damon for donating. Um, and the other people as well, that's really good. James DeWitt. And uh, anyone else who would like to say hello? Tom Graham. And so, and if any of you want to you know, get your name on this podcast, feel free to support us and everything. Yeah, and donate. Or even donate even more and you might get a mug, a t-shirt. So, or even better, you come onto this show and we talk about you and your favorite film. So. There we go. Um, so, <coughs> now we've done all that, uh, let's go back to what we were talking about with Quentin Tarantino. We've all picked our favourite Tarantino movies. Um, so let's start off with you, Daniel. Yours was uh, Reservoir Dogs, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was one of my favourites, but yeah, I decided to talk about that one since it's, uh, I think it's a little bit, one his first one, so of course, uh, people don't consider it his uh, best one, but uh, I don't know. I really liked it, you know. He, I, I, you know, it wasn't a this sort of what you call it, like non-linear sort of story down, wasn't it? It was all over the place, it was cut yeah. up and everything, so I don't really have anything to say about it right now for some reason. It it's kind of weird because I was watching Reservoir Dogs a couple of weeks ago and it's kinda of like um it's kinda of like on multiple viewing, like I could watch it if it was on, I'd watch it. But it's like it's not, it's not something that I'd watch voluntarily. I mean for his yeah. first first film that is brilliant what he did for his first film that is excellent but like and I'd be happy with that I'd be more than happy with that but it's kind of like it's still quite it's quite a boring movie yeah it doesn't really have that fun factor you can't really re-watch it after you've seen it yeah it's quite see it once and that's it yeah it's quite interesting I could watch it a few times but I I know most people can watch it twice and that's about it you got it because it's very it's very basic it's very simple to um, know and that's it. Uh, there's not that too many memorable lines in it either, like he's other films. So yeah, that's true. 
but it, it's also quite, well, I was watching it and it's like, it was weird watching it because I, I was watching it and I was like, this is actually quite slow and tedious. And then I kind of, well, after finishing it, I was like, that's actually, uh, it's, I don't know what about, what's about it, but it made me really like it. And it's really weird, like, I don't know. It's one of those movies that kind of, it's kind of like Pop Fiction. You watch Pop Fiction, like, like I really love watching Pop Fiction for a lot of it. And it's kind of yeah. like, um, it's like, you can't really watch it too much. Like, you could, like, then you kind of stop watching it and you kind of go, this is actually really good. Like, yeah. Mm. Which actually leads us on to your one, Josh, which is Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Yes. Oh, I've seen too many times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it really can't be explained because there's just too much to explain in it. But it's just great. The multiple, like, non-linear storylines that go on, go on in it. It's just... Yeah, it seems to be a favourite technique of them, doesn't it? Yeah. It took that it's straight from Reservoir Dogs and then <laughs> implemented it into Pulp Fiction. But it's kind of like with Pulp Fiction, he's always known for Pulp Fiction more than any of his other movies. Well, maybe Reservoir Dogs was it, it very well mentioned, um, and maybe some of his like Inglorious Bastards, um, uh, ex like just those three films that really cemented his name. Like well, Res Pulp, Pulp Fiction, yeah. anyway. But it's kind of like it, it, like other films that he's made, like Jackie Brown, Death. Well, no one knows about Death Proof. No, no one talks about Death Proof. Not too many people know about Jackie Brown. Either, to be honest, no. I, I didn't know about it. Until like a few a year or more. Ago, yeah. So. yeah. It's one of his less famous films. <clears throat> but it's because he just uses like in Pulp Fiction they talk about stuff in such an interesting way, whereas in Jackie Brown he thinks, oh, I'm going to take that and I'm going to build on it more. But it really didn't work for him in that way, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which is kind of a like really bad thing really because it's like he could have made something really good. Like because that's all the thing is though when you make something really good you're like I want to add this to my next film. But then you kind of spoil it for yourself, and it's something. Yeah. That, yeah. A special move only works once. You know, you know, you yeah. can't really do it all the time. So trying to yeah. reuse the mm. same formula, formula yeah. for like different films, kind of like what they did with Star Wars. Yeah, like practically. Episode four and then episode seven. <laughs> but that, it is a thingy. Um, all right, so we're moving on to mine, which was uh, Django Unchained. Mm. And uh, Django Unchained, the reason I like this movie more than any other Quentin Tarantino movie is just because it's fun, it's interesting, it really engages you. The, 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 the um, German doctor is amazing. Uh, it's, about a, um, it's about a slave that gets freed by the um, a German uh, bounty hunter. Uh, and then they sort of do a bit of bounty hunting and then he, they go to Candyland to save his wife. And um, it's really interesting because, again, the soundtrack's amazing. Yeah. Uh, everything about it's like the set design everything's really beautiful in it like it, it's really well made and I really like it it's, it's one of my favourites so, and then yeah. it introduced the most ridiculous blood scripts I've ever seen the Candyland shootout yeah. oh, yes. painted the walls with everything chest bursting open so, yeah. Yeah. I think that was too much blood <laughs> it was yeah it was an overdue you like, had a lot of fun in that between, one between that and Hateful Eight there's like they were both pretty bloody yeah I know yeah, yeah. <laughs> But <coughs> what's interesting about it as well is Django Unchained is meant to be like a lot worse. They edited so much of it out that it, with, with, it's a master. It's really good, really good. But it's like they edited. It was meant to be a lot, lot more darker. And he was like, yeah. Quentin Tarantino could handle it, but all other audience members can do. It. So in some ways, it could have been better if he did it more like that. But it yeah. just depends. Really, like, yeah. I don't know the way it came out. It kind of it was okay the way it came out. I I can't really see it being darker. No. Yeah, well, you know, slavery and everything, but hey, you know, you get it. It's just all just in the end, you know, yeah. when you think all hope is lost. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's everything that like, we need to talk about Quentin Tarantino. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about Quentin Tarantino? Like, I don't know. I think Inglorious Bastards is a little bit overrated, but yeah, I'm not fond. I think that might be my least favourite one of his films. Is it? Yeah. Never go into that one. Like, I've always liked the World War II sort of films, but this one. I thought it was all over the place. It was actually a bit pathetic. He was sort of yeah. lazy in this, like, and then just didn't think it was this him. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. yeah. <coughs> it's quite funny actually, because when we were doing our um, Inglorious Bastards didn't come. When we were doing this podcast, we had to do um, audience research, and and uh, people's favourite movie was Pulp Fiction by like one vote. But the one that was below it was uh, Kill Bill. Yeah. Um, so uh, I believe Pulp Fiction got. Seven, seven people wanted it, and then like it was about six for Kill Bill, yeah. and it's quite interesting because the majority of them, because I was watching it quite closely when my friends were going down, and I was looking through it, 
and the majority of them were girls. Like I think all of them were girls actually that did it. And um, it's quite funny because he always said that it was meant to, Kill Bill was meant to empower women, and it really does. Well, it's yeah. a really yeah. sort of Charlie's Angels, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's great. <clears throat> but, but it's kind of um, it's it's something that's decent. I I, I mean it's pretty good. Um, but yeah, that's. Sort of you prefer Volume One or Volume Two? Volume One. Yeah, I think everyone prefers like, Volume One. Volume Two was kind of boring and tedious. Like it, it, it took its it, it took its very slow start and. Yeah. Um, Unlike Hate for Eight, where it was super slow, but at least the dialogue was very entertaining. It wasn't yeah. as same volume two, but hey, I think you just wanted to finish this story. Hate for Eight didn't. There was like no deaths until like no, well not until the, into the very film. end. There was no deaths. It was all Crazy. talking about coffee and the letters. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's that's going back to what I said earlier about the sort of building between four walls, where where the tension can bounce between all three, but eventually it will have to go out into the audience, and then yeah. you feel tense because you don't know who's done what and who's done what. Like, uh, for example, when um, uh, Samuel Jackson's character was talking to, I believe it was the, sh the, the, um, the general? The general, yeah. Yeah, and he was talking about um, how he pretty much made his uh, son walk out in the snow. Um, and basically, um, he, was beg he wasn't begging anymore, he just wanted to heap before he died. And uh, basically, yeah. Yeah, uh, humiliated him. Yeah, and humiliated him. It was all building up to that to the general picking up his gun and then Samuel L. Jackson shooting him. Yeah, and it's that throughout the entire thing, so you don't know if they're telling the truth or not. It's yeah. really interesting. But that's all we've got time for for t today's podcast. Um, next week is uh, Christopher Nolan, that's our director for next week. Um, so yeah, that's uh, everything. So that's um, everything on the Say What Again podcast. Um, thank you for watching. Yeah, thank you for watching. See you guys later.